a new song together, though I imagine you've heard it before. It's called Holy Forever, and I'll show you the chorus. It says, your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, all thrones and dominions, and all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and then it says, the angels cry holy, and we join with them this morning as we consider who our God is, this great God that we get to serve. Um, and it's such a comfort that no matter what goes on in the world, um, God is above all of it. And he is with us right here in our hearts this morning. So let's try it out. Sing along as you catch on. And think about the words as we're learning it together. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the sounds like you know it and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the end your name your name
of that in these days. Let's continue to worship him. Thank you, Jesus. You can have a seat. Good morning. Just a few reminders for you. This coming Saturday, we'll be rolling up our sleeves and sprucing up the church uh, for our fall church cleaning from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. So if you can make it uh, and we all pitch in, it'll get done quickly. And then we'll be ready for our 82nd anniversary services, which will happen that following week from October 1st to the 6th. We'll have some pastors visiting us and people from other congregations. So um, you'll want to set aside some time in that week for um, some extra services, particularly on the Thursday and Friday of that week. Okay, also we have a women's retreat coming up at Spotswood, New Jersey, as you know. It's in about a month, October 25th to 26th. The cost is approximately $35. Some of you are registered already. And uh, if you plan to come for the day, particularly on Saturday, and you need a ride, please speak to me because um, you'll want to reserve a spot in Sister Stephanie's van. She's offered to drive. So um, if you need a ride, please let me know so I can reserve that for you. That's it. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. So, uh, yes, we have our anniversary meetings coming up. We want to be praying that the Lord will meet us. It's our 82nd anniversary. Church was started in 1942, so if you do the math, that's 82 years. Maybe we should read Psalm 82 and see what it says there. Maybe there's something for us. Uh, Pastor Mike Corrigan and his wife Donna will be coming up and ministering to us on that Sunday, October 6th, morning and evening. And uh, we'll open the church Sunday night for those that would like to. Uh, have an in-person meeting uh, with them and us. So uh, we look forward to that. And of course, our other fellowship ministers will be joining us throughout the week, some in the morning, some in the evenings. And uh, so there'll be a lot of variety. I think we need that. I, I'm the only voice you hear most often. And I think everybody needs to hear from another perspective and uh, take advantage of the gifts and talents that God has given to others. So let's make every effort to get out to these meetings and support them. People will be coming from other churches, and we want to be here to welcome them. Praise God. Amen. Trust you had a good week, um, generally speaking. You know, when people ask me how I am, or I say, well, generally speaking, I'm really doing well. If you want to know every specific about my life, <laughs> it'll take an hour to tell you the ups and downs. But, you know, Jesus brings such a stability in our lives, doesn't he? That's so wonderful that every day we wake up and we say, Lord, I belong to you and I'm going to live for you today. And if I meet trials, you're going to be there to help me. And, uh, and then when I experience the joys and the blessings that you have reserved for me, I'm going to praise you. Hallelujah. And so we keep our eyes on him and he keeps us on the right path. Amen. Praise God. Okay, so we have, a, we have a talk this morning. I made some slides. Haven't had them in a little while. And uh, Isai or Jemina, was there either of you volunteered to help? Okay, I'll call you up when we need you. Okay, just a moment. Isai, why don't you come up and sit up front, though, okay, so I can grab you. When I can think ahead a little bit and I can get somebody to read the scripture for us, I like that. Okay. During the week, I look to the Lord. Lord, what would you have me to minister on Sunday? And you have no idea how much I think about that all week long. Um, sometimes, in my own Bible reading, some thought will come to me. 
uh, that somehow the Holy Spirit quickens. You just know that this is the thing I need to think about and be preaching on Sunday. I don't know how the Lord does that exactly, but that's happened often. And then there are other times, maybe I'm reading something in a book, or maybe I'm in a meeting and I'm hearing a preacher, and a thought, a thought goes into my heart, and I start praying about that and looking into the Bible, and God helps to develop that thought. Sometimes you just have a passion about something, and uh, that's how it was this week. No thought particularly, uh, the Lord didn't trigger any thought in my heart from the Bible, any particular verse necessarily. And uh, as I was doing my reading throughout the week, there was nothing that particularly stood out to me. And, and so I'm praying, Lord, what is it that you want me to share with your people? You know what they need and what I need. And um, the thought came to me, well, what has been your passion? What's the thing that you've been praying about? What's that burden that I put on your heart? And I knew exactly what that was, so that's what I'll be preaching on this morning. The question, the one question that the church should be asking. These days, the church should be asking a question. What was that question? Well, last week we talked a little bit about Abraham and Isaac. And as Abraham was told to offer his son, he took Isaac and, uh, and he took the wood that they would need uh, for the sacrifice. He took the stone and the flint uh, to start the fire. And it says here in Genesis 22, 7, And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Remember that? We talked a little bit about that. They're heading up to Mount Moriah. Just him and his father, servants are waiting for their return. And he says, I know we've come here to offer a sacrifice. And Lord and Father, you've given me the wood to carry. And you have the fire, the thing to make the fire in your hand. But we don't have a sacrifice. Where's the lamb? And you remember what the Lord said? God himself will provide the lamb, the sacrifice. Well, that was a good question. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, we talked about what that represents. I think that the, uh, well, that the wood could represent the word of God. Uh, think of it this way, the prophecies that point to the coming of a Messiah that speak about his laying down his life and offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. We have the word of God. We have all the prophecies. And then the fire. That speaks about the power of God. It speaks about the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course the lamb. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so we see that so beautifully pictured for us in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus ever came to earth. God was already trying to paint a picture for us of the wonderful work of salvation that he would accomplish through the sending of his son. But today, the church is asking, we have the word, we have the wood, we have the Bible. How many Bibles do you own? You can turn the radio on any time of the day and night and hear the word of God being preached. Um, we have on our phones, you can look up a Bible app and you can read the Bible in any translation practically. We have the Bible, we have the, the promises, we have the prophecies. And we have the Lamb. We have Jesus. Jesus has died for us and he's come to live in our hearts and his presence is with us. But the question that the church is asking today or needs to ask is, but where's the fire? Isn't that interesting? Isaac said, we have the wood and we have the fire. Where's the Lamb? That's the Old Testament. But we, as the church of Jesus Christ, in these days, 
we say we have the wood, we have the word of God. And we have the lamb, Jesus has come. And now he lives in our hearts. But what is the church lacking? We're not lacking sermons and we're not lacking the presence of Jesus. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. He's here with us. We can't see him with our natural eyes. He's here though. And there are times when he makes his presence so real to us as we sing, as we worship him, as we love him and adore him, we sense his nearness, the peace, the joy, the love that he brings to us. But what the church is lacking is the fire. Where is the power? Where is the power of God? That's what the world needs. They don't need just sermons. They don't just need uh, religion, but they, they need to see and experience the power of God. And how often I pray, Lord, I say, where's that power? We're lacking that power. Our forefathers told us about the power of God in their day. Even in the, our own fellowship, as you go back and, and consider the history of our fellowship, oh, back in the day, you like that expression? We use that, back in the day. And that means something different depending on who's saying it, right? Back in my day might be different than back in your day. But anyway, back in the day, oh, people were healed, miraculously healed. In our own fellowship, among our own churches, they had wonderful testimonies of healing. People healed of cancer. People healed of diseases that uh, the doctors had no cure for. And, and they were given up to die. And in answer to prayer, God set them free and raised them up. And as a result, that, got, uh, that started a buzz among the family members. Now the person that they thought was going to die is well again. How did that happen? And that opened the door for them to tell their loved ones what Jesus had done for them. And people began to get interested in him. They started coming to church. They opened their hearts to the Lord and Many families got saved as a result of the power of God being manifested in the way that it was. There were people that were bound by drugs and, and other, uh, uh, even demon possession. And uh, Jesus came to them and the power of God set them free and people saw the tremendous change in their lives. And God was glorified. And people were drawn to the Savior. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues sometimes and other gifts began to manifest themselves in their lives. God began to use them in ways that it was so obvious that it had to be God because it was so far beyond anything that they could ever produce. And the power of God was, was real and the power of God was manifested and people experienced that. But where is that power of God today? Where's the healings that we're praying for? Oh, we don't minimize what God does. There are people that get healed and answer to prayer. Sometimes it takes time and they eventually get better as we continue to pray for them. Uh, but where are those miraculous healings that, that we see in the Bible and that we've heard about and others are experiencing in other places, perhaps? Where are the people getting filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Holy Ghost and their lives are being transformed and they're living victorious Christian lives? They've come out of the world completely and now the power of God is resting upon them and they're walking with Jesus and God is using them in mighty ways. Where's the deliverance? People are bound by sin and habits, evil habits. And they, they just can't break free. Even Christians are having trouble breaking free from some of their addictions and, and the, 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 the sins of their nature, their tempers and their, and, uh, and their greed and their covetousness and these things that tend to get hold of us. God has deliverance for us. We see that in the word of God. He says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Before you were a Christian, you were under the control of your sinful nature. You couldn't help yourself. You, you tried to resist, but you had no power to change. 
Uh, but when Jesus came into your life, now you are not under the dominion of sin any longer. Now the power of God is available to make you all that God wants you to be. But the question is, where, where is that fire? We've got the wood. We've got the word of God. We've got wonderful promises in God's word. And we've got the Lamb of God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never changed. But the church needs to start praying, God, where's the fire? Okay, Esai, I'm, I'm ready for you. Can you do that? You got to come up here. We're going to read it from here. So you don't even have to look. Okay. Esai is going to read for us some excerpts from Psalm 44. I would recommend that today you go home and read the whole psalm. But uh, here are some excerpts. Can you see from here? I think you could, right? Yeah, I see all that. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, God, we have heard it from our own ears. Our ancestors have told us of all that you did in their day and in their days, in days long ago. <laughs> You drove out the pagan nations by your power and gave all the land to our ancestors. You crushed their enemies and set their ancestors free. They did not conquer the land with their swords. It was not your own strong it was not their own strong arm that gave them victory. It was your right hand and strong arm and the and the blinding light from your face that helped them for your love for you love them. My eyes are a little bit. <laughs> more. Two words. There's more? Yes. But now you have tossed us aside in dishonor. You no longer lead our, on, our armies to battle. You make us retreat from our enemies and allow those who hate us to plunder our land. You let our neighbors mock us. We are an object of scorn and discern and derision to those around us. You have made us the butt of their jokes. They shake their head at us, they shake their heads at us in scorn. We can't escape the constant humiliation, shame is written across our faces. If we had forgotten the name of God or spread our hands in prayer to to foreign gods, God should surely have God would surely have known it. For for he knows the secrets of every of our. Can I read it? Can I read it from the book? Right there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Surely would have known it. For he knows the secrets of every heart. Wake up, O oh Lord. Why do you sleep? Get up. Do not reject us forever. Why do you look the other way? Why do you ignore our suffering and oppression? We collapse in the dust, lying face down in the dirt. Rise up. Help us. Ransom us because of your unveiling, unfailing love. Thank you. you have to make those, yeah, we have to make those a little bigger. Okay, just for the future. Praise God. So we have, we're not the only ones that were concerned about what happened to the power of God. Throughout the history of the children of Israel, there were times when God manifested his wonderful power. When they came out of Egypt, oh, what manifestations of God's power the people experienced. The ten plagues. Uh, the uh, turning the red the sea the water into blood and and the locusts and uh, and then the angel of death uh, passing through the land and so on and uh, God just proved himself as greater than all the gods of Egypt and that his power was greater than the power of all the gods that the people worshipped and with a mighty hand he led them out of their bondage. And then when they got to the Red Sea, what were they going to do? They were surrounded by the enemy, and the sea had shut them in. But God told Moses to hold up his staff, and then God caused a mighty wind to blow throughout the night. And God opened up the sea before them, and, and, uh, and with a blow dryer, he dried the land so that they wouldn't get stuck in the mud. And they walked across uh, the Red Sea on dry ground when the enemies tried to do the same and come to attack them, God closed the water up on them. And the next morning they saw the corpses of the Egyptian soldiers washing up on the beach. And how they rejoiced. Miriam got her tambourine and uh, Corey got on the drums and they started dancing around and praising the Lord. 
I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. And they sang how God is a man of war and, and so on. And then as they traveled through the wilderness, God manifested his power. He, he gave them water out of the rock. He gave them manna from heaven. As they went into the promised land, God fought their battles for them. They were often outnumbered tremendously. And uh, they were not experienced soldiers and warriors like the people that they were fighting against. But God gave them the victory. God fought for them. And he manifested his power. And they conquered one nation after another until they took their place in the land that God had promised to them and their forefathers. And they settled down in the land. But unfortunately, that as time went on, they began to get their eyes off the Lord. And then they began to worship some of the gods that the people of the land worshipped. And they began to break God's commandments or, or just go through things outwardly, but their heart wasn't in it. And little by little, they, they lost the power of God over their lives. And uh, they found themselves in bondage again. Uh, they couldn't resist the attacks of the enemy any longer. God didn't fight for them as he did before. And God told them through the prophets. He warned them. He said, listen, uh, you're, you're worshiping idols. Put away your idols and repent and turn back to God. If you forsake God, God will forsake you. But if you seek him with your whole heart, you'll surely find him. Praise God. And if God be for you, who can stand against you? And so God sent his prophets to plead with the people. There's a reason why you don't have the power of God any longer. Reason why you're not seeing the miracles. Why you're not able to withstand your enemies. But uh, if you'll deal with God and get right with him, God will restore you. And God will manifest himself to you again. And here in Psalm 44, that Esai read to us, um, they were going through a time of, uh, of dryness where they weren't seeing the, the power of God manifested. And, and the psalmist was, is praying. He's just opening his heart to God very honestly. And he's saying, Lord, our fathers, our forefathers told us about your great power and how you delivered them and answered prayer in, in such mighty ways. We heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the work you did in their days, in the times of old, how you drove out the heathen with your hand, planted them, and how you afflicted the people and cast them out, settled us into the promised land. And then they, he went on to say, and it wasn't by our own hand or our own power that gave us the victory, but it was God. It was God with us. God in the midst, fighting for us and, de and commanding deliverance for Jacob, his people. And then he says, but it's not like that anymore. In our days, you seem so far away. You've cast us off and put us to shame. You don't go with our armies. You make us turn back from our enemies. And they which hate us spoil they get spoil for themselves. You sell your people for nothing. And you don't increase our wealth. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a laughing stock or scorn, those round about us. And a byword among the heathen. They shake the head and a shaking of head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. God, what's happening? We're supposed to be your people. We have such a wonderful history, Lord. You have such a tremendous call over our lives, and you've given us so many blessings and privileges, but where are they? How come we're not experiencing them now? Where are those answers to prayer? Why are we bound? Why are people looking at us and laughing at us and saying, where is your God? Oh, you say that Jesus can do this and Jesus can do that, but where is it? Where is it happening? How come you're not living a holy life? You, 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 you just mix in with the world. You're not very different than we are. You have a religion. You go to church. You have a Bible. 
But when I look at the way you live and the way you talk, I don't see any real uh, distinction, any real difference. I remember one time I went to a wedding. I, I married this young couple uh, out on Long Island. And then I went to their wedding reception, and uh, the music was so wild. And I looked around, and everybody was dancing and shaking all over the place. <laughs> who knows who they were dancing with? And uh, then you listen to some of the songs. The song, if you actually listen to the words, they're not songs you should be singing at weddings about cheating on your girlfriend and, and this and that, right? And uh, the mother of the groom walked over to me and said, where's the distinction? This looks like like a worldly wedding. Uh, there's no difference. We just had a wonderful service, church service. We prayed. We asked for God's blessing. We asked him to unite this couple and use them for his service. And now we're going, and the alcohol's flowing, and the people are, are dancing around the golden calf, and, and the music is just like any music that you'd hear at any worldly wedding. Where is the distinction? What makes us different? What do people notice about us that they could admire or be drawn to? And uh, it came from the lips of, of the mother. And I looked around and I said, I think you're right. There's not much of a difference here than other weddings that I've been to where people don't know the Lord at all and have no interest in honoring him. And so that's, that's the state of the church too often. And then we wonder... He says here in the psalm, he says, listen, if we have lifted up our hearts to idols, to other gods, that would certainly cause us to lose the power of God in our lives and in our, in our midst. And if we've forgotten our God, we've forgotten the name of the Lord, and we've gotten all tied up with other things, and we don't pay much attention to God, we hardly get out to his house, we hardly pick up his word, we have no time or hardly for prayer, except when we get into trouble or, or a few seconds before we eat our food. He says, God, if, if that's the case, wouldn't God show us where we've lost the power of God so that we could repent and get it back again? And that's sort of what he's praying here in this psalm. He's saying, Lord, we don't, we're not aware of what we're doing to lose the power of God, but you know. If anybody knows, you know. You know why we're not seeing the answers to prayer as powerfully as we need to. You know why the lives aren't being changed as drastically as, uh, as they ought to. And Lord, we need you to show us. If it's something that we've done or that we're not, we should be doing that we're not, we need the Holy Spirit to show us. We need to take time to let the Lord do that for us. And we spend time reading the Word of God. We give God a chance to talk to us, a, God, a chance for God to show us things that we don't see. When we're in God's house, when we're hearing the preaching, when we're just sitting silently before the Lord in a prayer meeting, or just on our own, we're giving God time to search our hearts. and to sh He wants to show us. He wants to manifest his power. He wants to answer our prayers. We know that he's a God of love and compassion. He takes no delight in seeing us suffer, sickness or anything else. But God, is he's waiting for his people. I was reading something this week that said, you know, we, we wait on God. We wait for God. But, you know, there's another side to that coin. God is waiting for us. God is waiting for us to take time with him so that he can speak to us and reveal to us the things that we need to see and, and hear. Praise God. In the Old Testament, Elisha asked this question, where is the God of Elijah? Elisha had a Quite a responsibility. He, had, he was the successor of Elijah, Elisha, excuse me. 
Elisha was the successor of Elijah. And Elijah was a mighty prophet, a mighty man of God. God used him to raise the dead. God used him in tremendous ways to call the people back to God. And uh, I think one of the things that we think most of when we think of Elijah is him on Mount Carmel, challenging the prophets of Baal. There were over 400 uh, prophets of Baal and, and other prophets of other gods, other deities that the people worshipped. And, um, and there was a challenge. If, you're going to, if God is God, then serve him. And if Baal is God, then serve Baal. And so they met up on the mountain, Mount Carmel, and they, they laid the wood for the sacrifice, and they laid the animals, they slaughtered the animals, and they laid them on the sacrifice, on the wood. And then they said, now the God that answers by fire, he's God, and he's the only God, the only true God, and he is the one that we worship. And so he let the prophets of Baal go first. And they tried to get their God to send down fire from heaven and light the wood and consume the sacrifice. And they prayed. And they called on their God for hours. And nothing happened. No answer. Then they started cutting themselves and bleeding and, and just, uh, just uh, in, in all earnestness and uh, calling upon their God. And uh, after a while, they realized nothing was going to happen. Hours and hours, Elijah was making fun of them. Where's your God? Maybe he's, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe you need to call a little bit louder. So they called and they cried and they cut themselves and couldn't get their God's attention because he was no God. And then Elijah, he, 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 it was his turn. And he just said, oh God, the God that answers by fire, show this people, show these people that you're the true God. And, uh, and then suddenly fire came down from heaven and it, it uh, consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the animal. It, 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 it lapped up the water in the trench that surrounded the altar. And the people fell down on their faces and they cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And uh, God had manifested his tremendous power, and the people acknowledged that, that there's only one God, and they turned away from their idols, their idols that couldn't hear their prayers, that couldn't do anything. The Bible says those idols were blind and they were deaf. They couldn't see the people and they couldn't hear a word that they said. It's like praying to a piece of stone. And yet our God, our God hears our prayers. God sees our need. And God comes down to deliver us. So I like that. Where is the God of Elijah? Well, when did Elisha say that? Well, toward the end, when uh, Elijah was going to be taken up in a fiery chariot up to heaven, somehow uh, Elisha was aware of that. And others too, because everywhere they went, people would say to Elisha, do you know that the Lord's going to take your master from, from you today? And he said, I know. Be quiet. He didn't want them to just get into a big discussion about it. He knew that he needed to stay as close to Elijah as he could because he was believing God for something. He was believing that the spirit that rested upon Elijah would come upon him and that he too would experience the power of God in his life and in his ministry. If he was going to take over for Elijah, he needed a double portion of his spirit. And so he talked to Elijah about that. Elijah said, why are you following me so closely? He said, I need a double portion of your spirit. He said, well, if you see me when I, I'm taken, then God will grant you that. And so he went to one place. Elijah told him, you stay here. And he said, no, nothing do, and I'm, I'm going with you. And then he went to another place. You stay here. No, I'm, you can't get rid of me. And so finally, they, were, they came to the river. And Elijah took his mantle and he smote the river and the river split open just like the Red Sea and they crossed over to the other side. Then it closed up behind them 
And then suddenly this fiery chariot comes down from heaven and a whirlwind sweeps Elijah up off the ground. And Elisha looks at him. And, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he sees him going up into heaven and he drops down his mantle, his outer garment, falls on the ground. And then Elisha now picks up that mantle and he goes back to the river and he says, where is the God of Elijah? Where is the power of God that rested upon him? He said that if I saw him leave, that God would grant me a double portion of his spirit, his anointing. And so he took that mantle and he hit the river and the river split open just like it did for Elijah. And he crossed over. And all the people saw that the power of God that was upon Elijah has now been passed on to Elisha. And they began to respect him and, as the prophet. Uh, and they came under his ministry. And when you, do, when you, when you read the stories, and we did that not, not too, too long ago, but we studied the life of Elijah on, on our Thursday night Bible study, and then we went on to study the life of Elisha somewhere along the way. And uh, Elisha, God used him to perform twice as many miracles as we read in the life of Elijah. And maybe that's a picture of the double portion of his spirit. Twice as many miracles manifested themselves through his life. And the amazing thing was uh, the last miracle was after he died. He died and he was put in a tomb. And, and the Bible tells us that uh, some, someone died and they were carrying the body and then the enemies started coming, and so they, they had to get rid of the body real quick, and they had to run to safety. So they threw his body in the same tomb that Elisha was buried in. And when the man's body touched the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. And that was the last miracle, I guess, that, uh, that we needed to make it a double portion. Amazing. This is in the Old Testament, these tremendous manifestations of God's power. But... As we get into the New Testament, we read some wonderful verses that remind us that he's just the same today. This is one of the first, this is, I think, the first verse that I ever underlined in my Bible as a teenager. My parents bought me a Thompson Chain reference Bible, and uh, I wanted to be very careful. I didn't want to just end, underline everything and make it look like a mess. But there was a verse that said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God Onto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, Romans 1.16. Yet there was a time in my life when I had uh, begun to follow Jesus and I was in high school and a lot of my friends were getting into all kinds of sins and into drugs and, and relationships and ungodly relationships and they were trying to kind of encourage me to come along with them. And... Um, but Jesus had made himself real to me, and I had given myself to Christ. And uh, this verse spoke to me. I shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God. It's the power to change lives. It's the answer that the world needs. And uh, I should be living it and sharing it with others. I told you that... Uh, out in Patchogue, Long Island, if you've ever been out that far. Um, I was walking on a Saturday, I was walking along Patchogue. That's where all the stores were. Sometimes we'd hang out in Patchogue if we had nothing to do. And uh, I was walking down the, down the street, Main Street, and I saw a friend from school, a fellow from school who was a Christian and who was a very... Um, he didn't hide his light under a bushel. He made everybody know that he was a Christian. Uh, before homeroom class in the library, he and other Christians got together and they would pray uh, for their day together, maybe read something in the Bible. I, I remember people laughing at them as they, as they passed by. Look at those Jesus freaks over there. And this fellow would hand out tracts. He would tell people. And as I was walking down the street in Patchog, I saw this fellow handing out tracts and starting conversations with people about their need of, of, of Jesus, of salvation. 
And I didn't want to get into a conversation with him, and so I crossed the street and went past by on the other side. And then the Lord spoke to me, or a thought came to me, you, could, you consider yourself a Christian. Why are you avoiding talking to a fellow Christian? Why are you ashamed? Are you ashamed of me? Are you ashamed of the gospel? And oh, that really went right into my heart. And so, and then one morning in school, I went into the library and I saw them gather together in a little circle praying. And me and my friends were sitting somewhere else and my friends were actually laughing, uh, calling attention to those Christians over there laughing. And the Lord said to me, you're sitting with these friends when you should be with them. And I realized that I was intimidated. Uh, I was embarrassed to share the gospel. I, I didn't know how my friends would react. And the Lord really dealt with me. Not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God. And God began to deal with me and eventually he helped me in school to begin to make it known that I was a follower of Jesus, that I loved him, that he had changed my life. And uh, I wish I would have done that earlier, but in my last year in high school, people began to see that I was a, a Christian, a born-again Christian. And uh, God helped me to overcome that shame. But one thing that helped me to overcome it was this next verse in the Bible. For you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you should be my witnesses. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The only way that I was able to overcome the intimidation of the world and to take my stand for Christ and not be ashamed of the gospel was I needed to get filled with the Holy Spirit and get filled with the power of God. Ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And so I began to pray, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me with the Holy Ghost. And little by little, God began to come to me in new ways. And, and, and as he began to bring deliverance into my life. And I experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that I had never experienced before. And then I could praise him. And then I could testify. And then I could witness to others. And uh, I wasn't uh, afraid of what they thought or, or whether they'd separate me from their company or not. But I knew that Jesus was real and he was living in me and the power of God was resting upon my life. And now, there's one more verse. And this is a verse that as a preacher, I often pray about. The Apostle Paul said, I've decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And my speech and my message were not in persuasive or plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The Apostle Paul said, when I came to you preaching, I wasn't concerned about giving you a lovely speech or impressing you with my rhetoric uh, my eloquence, he said, uh, my speech wasn't very eloquent, but the thing that made my speech uh, impressive was that it was accompanied by the power, the demonstration and power of the Spirit. I didn't just speak words to you, but when I spoke the words that God gave me, God accompanied those words with power. When I spoke about healing, people got healed. When I spoke about deliverance, people were set free. When I spoke about being born again, people's lives were changed from the inside out. And they, they were, became new creatures in Christ. God gave them a brand new life. And so, the Apostle Paul said, when I came to you, you know, there are other people that they preach to you, and it's just a bunch of words. Some of them are very good speakers, and they can move an audience and they can get you to cry when they want you to cry, and they can get you to laugh when they want you to laugh, but there's no power behind it. It doesn't do anything to change your life, to give you the help that you need from God. And he said, I didn't want to come and just give you words. I insisted that when I preach the word of God, that God will accompany it with power, so that your faith doesn't rest in my words, but 
your faith rests in the power of God. I've heard other ministers say, you know, people need more than words. In these days, people need more than sermons. You, you, can, you, can, you can hear sermons all day long if you want to. But what people need is they need God's power to be manifested. They need to experience the Lord. They need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And so, our fathers have told us, Lord, the wonderful ways in which you moved and the way in which you answered prayer in their day. And Lord, we thank you for what you've, you're doing in our day, but Lord, it's not like it should be. It's not like we heard that it was in the past and what we see in the word of God. I say, Lord, we can't keep just talking about healing and then not see people healed. Then it's just words. And people don't put their trust in God. Jesus is not being glorified. People don't think of him as the mighty healer because they're not seeing the power of God to bring about healing in people's lives. They don't think of Jesus as the great deliverer that that he says he is, because there are people that are professing to be Christians, but they're still bound by all types of sins and lifestyles. But, oh God, where is that power of God? Have you changed? No, the Bible says God doesn't change. Then we must have changed. And God knows how, how we can get in line with the power of God again and we need to see our need of that, and we need to start praying that way. And it has to be more than just, I want to see the power of God when I'm sick, when I'm in trouble, when I am short on my finances. We have to get to a place where we want to see the power of God because we want Jesus to be glorified. We want people to see how great and how powerful and how able he is. And it's not about me and my need, but it's about him and his glory. And when we start to pray that way, God will begin to show us things and God will begin to move in our midst and God will begin to break through. I don't know if you can read that. It's kind of lost in the flames there, right? It says, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God. That's the prayer that Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel when it was his turn to call down the fire of God from heaven. He said, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God. That's why I want you to manifest your power, not to make me appear to be some great prophet. The people need to know that there's only one God and you are that God. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, you have to manifest your power so that people can see that you're real and you will be glorified. And so I want to challenge us this morning and I, I know that the Holy Spirit has to really do that. But um, I think we would all say, oh God, where is that power? Where are those healings? Where are people being baptized in the Holy Ghost nowadays? Where is the deliverances that, that we've been trusting you for? We preach it. Uh, why don't we go out and tell someone about Jesus and pray with them right there on the street uh, and see their lives changed? Well, God, in these days we see the power of Satan. Uh, he's manifesting his power in very real ways. And more than ever, we need to see the power of God. And so, Lord, as a church, as a people of God, get us on our faces and get us to the place where we call on God and insist, Lord, I need, I need more than sermons. I need more than church. I need Jesus. I need his power to transform my life. We need, we need more than to just pray prayers, but we need to pray in answers and get results. And oh God, we want Canarsie, we want the people to see that Jesus is real and that he's coming soon and that he can help them whenever their need may be, whatever their past may be, that Jesus is able. And so Lord, help us. 
Oh God, come to us. And um, do you think God would hear and answer a prayer like that? Do you think that's what he's waiting for? Maybe he's waiting for us to really see the absolute necessity and waiting for his people to insist, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever changes you need to make in my life, whatever you need to show me, oh God, just that your name would be glorified and your glory would be revealed, your power would be manifested. Do it in this church. You know, I, I often think of our little church here in Canarsie, and I close with this thought. I say, you know, Lord, I would like to see more people in the church. Obviously, you would too, right? And uh, every church full, every pew full, we've had that in the past. Uh, we've been doing some house cleaning, and we're coming across some old photographs of Canarsie, and Sister Elsie, and Sister Elsa, and Brother Walter, and uh, these different ones, and Vacation Bible School, where the whole auditorium was full, every pew was filled. Christmas programs where we had to put up chairs because we didn't have enough seats for everybody. We've experienced those days. And we've experienced mighty moves of God's Spirit. But I say, Lord, I would love to see the, the pews filled. But I don't want I don't want the just I don't want this place to just be filled with people if you're not here to meet them. I don't want this place to be filled with people with a lot of problems unless you, in your great power, can meet them and meet those and, and meet those needs and, and be the answer to those problems. We don't need a bunch of sick people coming, seeking healing and not finding it. We need the power of God in our midst so that when people come seeking healing, they find deliverance and healing in Christ and new life and deliverance. And to have a, to have a church full of people but no power of God there to meet them well, that's just a social club, and uh, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in God meeting people. And so in our prayer meetings, you know, if you're there on Tuesday nights or on Friday mornings, there you often hear the prayer, Lord, fill this place with your glory so that when people come, they meet you, Lord. They recognize you're here. Their lives are changed. They experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the preaching, in the prayers, in the praise, that God works and moves and changes lives. And so as we continue to pray, Lord, send the fire, send the fire, then God will bring people to come and see the fire. You know, there's something about a fire. People like to go and see it, right? Oh, the house is on fire. Everybody starts, the traffic stops, and everyone wants to watch the fire burn and see what's happening. And... Uh, they said that years ago, and I wasn't around at that time, but they said that people actually saw a fire burning over this church. And they came to see what the, and the, the fire, but it wasn't a natural fire. It was some unusual manifestation of the Lord over this place. Now, I've been told that that was the case. But uh, whether people see a flame... God can draw people to the fire. And that fire is Jesus himself. He's the power of God. And so, as we bring this meeting to a close and we, we're going to sing yet, let's, let's really ask the Lord. And as we approach our anniversary meetings, Lord, let this be our focus. Lord, we, we thank you for all that you've done in the past. But Jesus, we need you now more than ever. And Lord, we have, we have the wood, we have the word of God, we have the lamb of God. And now, Lord, to make it complete, we pray, send the fire. Oh, Jesus, send the fire. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. There's a lot of songs in the songbook about fire, and God sending the fire and the power. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Let's just take a moment to look to the Lord, maybe quietly. Let God speak to you. He wants to manifest his power in your life. He wants to bring you the healing that you're trusting him for. Not just a little touches here and there, but 
a complete and perfect healing, wants to meet you and bring you out of your debt, supply your every need. In those areas in our life where we have trouble, we're still struggling, God wants to set us free and enable us to live a holy life, a victorious life, not fall back into the same habits and sins that have followed us. God wants to bring us out completely. Oh God. Lord, we pray that you'll put that desire in every one of our hearts to see Jesus more greatly glorified. We pray that you won't allow us to be satisfied with just a blessing here or there. Lord, but we pray that, that you who paid a tremendous price to enable us to be set free and uh, that you will come forth and show people what you can do, Lord. Oh God, there are so many people in this neighborhood, they have no interest in Jesus Christ and they have no reason to have an interest in him unless you show them who you are. And Lord, we know you do that through your people when they come across Christians and they see what God has done in their lives, then it awakens in them a desire to know you, to experience you as others do. And so, Lord, come to us as a church. Come to us as we prepare for anniversary meetings. Do a new thing, Lord. Let there be a greater breakthrough, we pray. Let the power of the Holy Ghost come upon us and be more firmly established in our midst, Lord. That every time we come together in your name, we, we know that you're there. We feel that you're there. We see evidence that you're there because of the changes that you bring about in all of our lives. And then, Lord, let others come to see the fire, to warm themselves, to experience Jesus as their Savior and Deliverer, Healer and Baptizer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's sing, not by power, might, or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Might be in our computer. If not, I know it's in the songbook. By my spirit. Do you see that there, Beth? No? Yes, yes good. Okay. Amen. So let's stand together with our sister Martine. <laughs> Is there a mountain in your path to doubts and fears abound? Press on, oh, hear the Spirit say, this mountain shall come down, not by my not by power and I've just been preaching about power this morning but there's a difference between our power and God's power God's power is manifested by the Holy Spirit that's what we're wanting and that's what we're praying for that's what God promises here we go is there a river in your path a river deep and wide Seven, the waters will
indicates that in the last days God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. We're living in the last days and uh, we have every right to believe that the power of God is going to be more greatly revealed in this world. And we want to be among those that receive the power. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Lord, when you manifest your power, I want to be part of what you're doing. I want to experience that power in my life and and through my life. And oh, God is calling us to get ready for that. And one thing is to call, one way is to call upon him and say, oh God, sh straighten out my life and bring me in line so that when you pour out your spirit, I'll be right where, there to receive all, all that you are doing. I want to be part of it. I don't want to miss it, Lord. Praise God. And so I'm encouraging you, I'm asking you, please pray with me. Pray, let's begin to pray, maybe as we've never prayed before. Oh God, Jesus, you come. You come to this church. You come to our families. And Lord, come in all your glory and all your power. Oh Jesus, we pray. Amen. Here we go, last verse. Then trust alone the mighty God. He speaks, the winds obey. Take courage, stand on faint and hard. For you, he'll make a way. Not by might, not by power. By my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Not by might, hallelujah. But by my spirit, death the Lord. His mountain shall be removed. His mountain shall be removed. His mountain shall be removed. By my spirit, death the Lord. His mountain shall be this mountain shall be removed. This mountain shall be removed. I, my spirit, said the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, let's praise him a moment before we leave this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, we claim your power, Jesus. We claim your presence. To go with us into this day, Lord. Healing power. Delivering power. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, pour out your spirit upon this assembly, Lord. Jesus, have your way. Jesus, show us your glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we want our young people to see that Jesus is real. It pays to put their trust in him. Hallelujah. Oh, he alone can satisfy. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. 
us, Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh God, I thank you. Praise God. Does someone have a prayer on their heart that they want to pray? Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit if God impresses you. Yield yourself. Oh, praise God. Yes, Lord. Amen. You are our God. You are our Father. There's no Lord, other God beside you, Lord. We come before Lord, you. Lord, to whom can we go? We are your people. You are our God. Yes, Lord. Lord, help. Help us, Lord. Yeah. Help us, Lord. We need your help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Beauty for ashes. Thank you, Jesus. You are Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Just one more chorus. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me spirit of the living god fall fresh on me melt me mold me fill me use me Hallelujah. Oh, God is here in a very precious way. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Move the mountains, Jesus. Yes, Lord. God, make a change, Jesus. Lord, you're able. Hallelujah. Claim. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, you know all the things that we've been praying about and are praying about, and we know that you're hearing and we know that you're answering, Lord. But Lord, we claim an, an abundant answer in every case, Lord. And in every need, we claim the power of God to bring about the needed change, Lord. God, we're praying for answers. We're not just praying to say words 
or to show concern. But Lord, we're praying because you said that when we pray, God hears and answers. He removes those mountains by his power. Lord, things that we can't do anything about. Lord, you step in and you show us what you can do. And Lord, we're claiming that. Oh God, don't let us get discouraged or give up, but renew our faith. Give us a greater sight of you today, Lord, and help us to go after those things with, with greater fervor and determination and confidence that our God, hallelujah, is faithful to his promises, and we're going to believe him and, and, and see him move in new ways and bring greater glory to his, his name. Amen. Oh, praise God. Amen. God bless you all. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to go. Thank you for coming out this morning. Oh, hallelujah. God's got great things in store for us. Let's keep pressing on. Amen. Hallelujah.